GT Church, it is so good for us to have a moment to address a very, very important, important issue in our culture right now. It is without a doubt on so many people's minds as we consider what's happening down south of us, just, just across the border, so close to where we all live. In fact, just recently, even just today of this filming, there was issues last night in Seattle where there was clashes with police and um, with rioters and, you know, the protests that have come as a result of the racial unrest in the United States. And so today I want to talk with a dear friend of mine, Pastor Andrew Beresford. I want to talk with him about this issue, the issue of racism and the need to understand in a broader context what's really going on, what's really happening in our nation. And so we do this out of friendship and we do this with a desire to understand. And so I wanna encourage you to lean into this conversation. It's on your mind, but let's learn together today and uh, as we listen. And so I, I wanna talk honestly, I want us to talk openly and even candidly about what's happening in the United States as well as in Canada. And, uh, and so I'm going to turn my attention now with you to my dear friend, Andrew Beresford. My friend! So my good. Brother. So good to, up, to have some time with you today. Thank you so much for, yeah. for joining us. Such an honor. Such an honor, man. Pleasure. I, I just want to say, you know, um, I just really value our friendship. And I feel like anytime I can get around you, even just our little text exchange, checking in, how was Sunday? How you doing? How's your soul? How's your heart? It means, it means the world to me, man. And I, I just love yeah. you and appreciate you. Thankful for our friendship. Um, but just, you know, just for those who are, who are watching today, who, um, who don't have the same knowledge that I do about this, this great man and beautiful family man and, and, and precious children and amazing wife. Can you, hey, just tell us about your family and your church for just a moment. Man, well, well first of all, I just want to take a moment to honor you, Pastor Andy, you and your lovely wife. You guys have been such a blessing to my wife and I mm -hmm. uh, from Jump Street, from, you mm -hmm. know, from day one that we met. You guys have been such a massive encouragement to us. And we just honor you uh, for your support. We honor you for the unequivocal love that you and unwavering love that you've shown to wow. us, you know? So thank you for that, man. Your friendship is massive. Um, now, as it pertains to Serve City, we, we uh, pastor Serve City. My wife and I started about three years ago. Um, we grew up in Toronto, left, went to the States for 14 years. And it's there that we started ministry and all that sorts of stuff. And our family got married. And then we came back home about five years ago to Toronto and so it's been really awesome to be home with, you know, here back in our in our hometown and um, and to be, be doing ministry here. We got three kids, uh, Gabriel, Noah and Claire, uh, my princess. She has me wrapped around her little finger, man. <laughs> and uh, and so and my wife and I, we've been married. Uh, my wife, Chantal, and I, we've been married for 14 years this year. So. Awesome. Um, so it's been a, it's a blessing, man. And, and I guess that's a little, I don't know if you want me to go to like, I like long walks along the beach and <laughs> all that sort of stuff, but <laughs> you know, I, I just think it's important to say that serve city church is part of the arc family as well. Yeah. And we are so blessed to have been a part of that journey with you as you, you planted. And I mean, I just want to say for everybody who's watching that, you know, uh, you're one of my favorite communicators you use. Um, you use a, an ability to be incredibly candid with a passion for Jesus and an intelligence in your, in your articulation of your theology. And uh, so I'm, I'm blessed. We were so blessed to have you at a door, which is our Sunday night experience that one time. Yeah. I look forward to the next time when we can have you. And as you learned, Victoria is a place that you can't come alone. You got to bring Chantal next time you come, my man. Man. I told my wife, I was like, if we were not at Serve City, like that is like a hidden paradise <laughs> in, in Canada. And, yeah. and it was, I did not want to come home. If it was not for my wife and the kids, I would have wanted to stay there <laughs> a lot longer. Can't wait to bring her with me the next time, man. 
Well, we're going to do it. I guarantee you. And uh, the everybody watching is going to be able to hold me to that. We'll look forward to that time. But, <laughs> but you know, I do want to. I want to value the time we have. And um, you know, it was. It was. We've had a, a couple of exchanges by phone and text about what's going on right now. And yeah. um, man, I just. I, I asked you, would you be willing to help us understand from your vantage point? Um, from, you know, um, from a black Canadian perspective, as well as from a black American perspective, help us understand you, like me, have had that cross-cultural experience. And so you, you've seen racism in, in, in the U.S., um, but we live in Canada. And so we need to talk about what it means to be in a Canadian context. So, yeah. you know, maybe as we as we start today, I just I just want to ask you, can you tell us from your perspective, what's going on? Like when we look down south of the border and we see, I mean, like the, you know, 40 cities having riots and and buildings being burned down. And and, and of course, we we must pause and just respect that there was a man who lost his life. Um, at the hands of uh, police in in Minneapolis, George Floyd, and um, it has sparked a fire. But can you help us understand maybe some of the context for why now, why this way, why this storyline playing out right now in America? Well, that's a great question, and I applaud your you know the courage to tackle such a a topic, you know, right in the in the heat of it, and that that speaks to your character um, as well. And you know, really, right now, you know, in America, in an American context, um, Black Americans are upset, you know, mm-hmm. um, and that's what you're seeing. What you're seeing is the fruit of of the the rage and the anger of many Black Americans, and then even now over here in Canada. Um, who are just upset because historically this is something that has been transpiring time and time again. You know, um, racism, overt racism, especially in America against black people. And what happens is, you know, scenarios such as uh, what's happened with George Floyd, um, which I, I think the reason why it is so um, pervasive right now, the anger, the rage, the all that we're seeing right now, it's out there, is because we had a triple whammy, you know? It was Ahmaud, <laughs> Ahmaud Arbery, uh, what happened with him. Yeah. Um, and then, like, on the coattails of that scenario where we were just getting past that, um, then we have Breonna Taylor and we have George Floyd, mm-hmm. um, who are all murdered by police. And what... So, because it was so overt, um, and then now... All of these things are just a microcosm hmm. of the historic um, racism that has happened systematically against Black people. So this is why this is why the rage is there. The Bible says in Proverbs thirteen verse twelve that um, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Yeah, and that's really we've had a lot of promises and all this sorts of stuff. I mean. Even back to Trayvon Martin, when it kind of all this started taking place, yeah. you have people being able to just ride up on black people, um, execute judgment on them based on profiling them immediately, right? And then it takes months, sometimes years, for an arrest to take place, right? When on the flip, you have a black man that they suspect with George, um, with George Floyd, they suspect that he used, it's alleged that he used a fake $20 bill or wrote a bad check. And that's a death sentence for him. And his killers now have been arrested, but they were arrested shortly. (laughs) They were arrested time after the offense took place, even though it was blatant, even though it was overt, right? All over the news and the media. And then the other officers, look how long it was t- it's taken for them to be apprehended. And the most that was done is they're fired. And so people are like, we want justice. And their their hearts are sick, as the Bible talks about it. Yeah. There's been so much, whether whether it's we've protested peacefully or we wilded it out, you know, hmm. um, there has been no resolution. And scenarios like this keep playing out time and time again. So what you're seeing is just a microcosm um, of the 
racism that we experience on a daily basis. And these flashes and these things that are inflamed in the media just kind of make um, Black people flare up, you know, mm. um, all over the place. So, so that's kind of what's happening. It's anger, it's rage, it's, it's, it's yeah. hope deferred, it's heart, sick hearts. And yeah. that's what's taking place in a nutshell. Thanks for that. Would you say that, you know, I mean, it feels like a bit of a perfect storm with the coronavirus and the lockdowns and all the deaths. I mean, I've even, I've even heard that um, it's a disproportionate number of black people who are affected even by the pandemic. Um, and I, I don't really know what that means or why. I don't know if it's because of living conditions, proximity, if it's health related, if it's poverty. Uh, I, I don't know the answer, but I could imagine that there was just a simmering of emotion and then these things just cause the pot to boil over. Absolutely. And again, as you said, all of those things that you mentioned are factors. Mm -hmm. And again, when we're talking about systemic racism, which I know we'll dive a little bit more into over the, the course of this convo, um, that's really the issue. That's what's at the root of it. Mm -hmm. The living conditions, the healthcare system, um, white people being favored over people of color um, as it pertains to care and all of these various things. And this is why one of the reasons why um, you know black people are being affected even in this in this season by COVID more than you know white people. And you know so all of these things, as you're saying, this is not something most white people. Um, it's just so because of the overt nature of what took place with 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 George Floyd. It's like there is without question. And, and unfortunately, a lot of white people, they're upset just because just looking at comments and hearing conversations and all of this, they're upset about what the cop did to George Floyd. But they don't realize. So it's like, oh, this was a crooked cop. But it's if you don't see deeper than that. Then you think, oh, man, this is just a crooked cop who needs to be fired. Mm. Right. I heard cops saying white cops saying, oh, you just made our job harder because you were crooked. Mm. But the issue is so much deeper than just a crooked cop. Right. It's right. a crooked system. Right. Which manifests. So it's not this just this event that equals racism. Mm. This is something that's been happening. COVID and what's happening with COVID and black people in the midst of COVID. You know, this, that's an event to the people who see it in an overt manner right now because of the cluster of events that are happening. But for us, this is historic wow. and this is systemic and it's been happening even before this. Can, can I ask you a question? I mean, I, I'm going to I'm going to ask you a question that, you know, it, it, it's a it's a it's a hard question for me to ask because I want to be so sensitive um, mm -hmm to your experience, but would you be willing, Andrew, to let us into your own heart? I mean, in terms of how you have felt, what has been your thought process? What has been your anger, your frustration, your personal, you know, reality in the midst of what you have seen? You know, I, I've been privileged to uh, follow you on Instagram and see you share and even to receive a text message from you that that opened your heart up just a little bit for me to see and and really fueled my desire to have this conversation. But, you know, I mean, when you think about your family, your kids, your wife, when you think about your own experience, your parents, help us understand what you feel in the midst of all of this. Well, I share the grief and the sorrow that another black man, you know, when you're talking about the crimes that we've seen in um, in the United States, I feel the grief um, because of the simple fact that a, a black man lost his life mm -hmm. over twenty dollars. You know, yeah. um, you know. So, so there's the grief that's there, and the long list of other black people, even children, who have been shot over water guns. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, it, it's treacherous. So, for me, and I, just to kind of go all the way back, um, my dad would share stories with me about how. Um, white people, when he was in school, would break into the bathroom. Um, one of his friends in particular broke into, uh, had was while he was taking a shower, a white man broke into the bathroom and opened the shower curtain on him to see if he had a tail because he was taught in his home that black people have monkey's tails and that the, their skin is dirt and it washes off into the bathtub 
And so he he sexually assaulted him, ultimately um, opening these this curtain and looked at him to see if he had a tail and then and, and if his skin was washing off, you know, wow. um, then to me where I'm, you know, in school and my white teacher in the fourth grade, uh, Mr. Heap told me you're going to be nothing more than a track runner and a truck driver, you know, and it's not that there's anything wrong with truck drivers or track runners. But he was condescending. He was he was telling me these things. He was stereotyping me. Um, he was trying to confine me to something. In that same school, um, they told me, you're not smart enough to play a musical instrument, you know? And I wanted to play the saxophone, you know? And I, would, I remember, I can vividly see myself standing outside the band room door, looking in as all the white kids were able to play. And I was just wishing, and people wonder why I'm so passionate about music. Um, this is now that I am, um, you know, and it was birth in, in, in out of this experience. My kids come home and so, uh, you know, a, a white kid wiped dirt on his jacket and told him, you know, um, that your, that your jacket is dirty, like your skin, you know, uh-huh. um, uh, there, there are a number of experiences. So for me, like I said, the reason why this is upsetting, yes, the loss of life, but also it reminds me about what we experience every day, being followed around grocery stores, mm-hmm. simply because when people see you, they think immediately, I'm black. It, depending on the way your hair is, depending on the way you're dressed, if you see a black guy with braids, as you, you've seen I've had my hair braided, mm-hmm. um, or if I wear jeans that are not you know, tight fit, that, that automatically means that I'm a thug or I'm going to steal something. You know, um, just and, and these are the kinds of experiences that we face, not to talk about in a you know ministerial level and all these other things, but statements, um, experiences. So my kids, I got to tell them stuff like when you are pulled over, you know, and these are conversations I got to have with my kids, especially because my kids, you know, grew up the first part of their life in the United States. And I'm telling them if, if you're approached by a cop, even as a child, do not put your hands in your pockets, you know, look at him in his face or her in their face. Make sure that, you know, that, that don't go reaching for anything. Don't get argumentative because at any point, because they're shooting kids too with water guns. And so for me, it's like to have these conversations with my sons, to make them think that, to let them know that their skin is potentially viewed as a weapon, yeah. you know, that their skin is weaponized, that just because you're black, you know, nine out of 10 times, if you try to fend for yourself, if you try to put up a case or a fight, Historically, you know, you could end up dead for things that white kids would simply get away with. When when Ahmad Arbery was, you know, running down the street and he walked into uh, the unde- underdeveloped house and then came out and continued his run right before he got shot. You know, I, I have white friends and people who are like, man, we walk through houses all the time that are undeveloped. We run. I, I mean, I'm a I'm a long distance runner and I. I, I you know, we, we walk through houses all the time. People say we do so, but that's not a death sentence, right. you know? Yeah. And so things things like that white people don't realize that they're able to just do on a regular basis because, because of their skin color, right, um, Are can be a death sentence for us. And so these are the conversations I'm having at the dinner table. These are the things that I worry about when you're when my kids leave the house, you know, what what's going to happen? What type of a call am I going to get? You know, um, and, and it, those those are the things. It's, it's heavy on my heart, yeah. man. It really is. Thank you, thank you for being being open with us about that because that the the conversations you were just discussing are not ones that I've had to have at my house with my kids, and the only difference is the color of their skin. That's it. We're both Christian families, believers in Jesus raising our kids at different stages in their life. The only difference is the color of my skin and the color of your skin. And, yeah. and even as you're sharing, this leads us into our next question, Andrew, and that is um, you, were just, you were just sharing experiences, even some that your children have had. So my question for you is uh, when you hear Justin Trudeau talk, as he did even this morning, about systemic racism and discrimination being present in Canada um, for all minority groups. Um, when you when you hear him say that, what 
What, what do you feel? What do you think of? Do you, obviously, you would agree, but is it true that, you know, we look down south and we see what's going on there, and then we look at Canada and we think, oh, man, it's a, it's a sweet, precious place where everybody gets along, everybody smiles and is happy. Are some of your experiences of systemic racism present here in Canada? Like some of the stories you're telling me, is this, is this all when you were in America or down in the States or, or is some of that here? And that, that's the thing. And, you, and it's a really great question, wow. man. I think that the, you know, again, the thing that it's very easy for Canadians because we're very polite, you know, that's one thing. Yeah. Um, and so we're saying sorry for everything. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Right. And like you said, everybody's so friendly. And so we're the polite thing to do is yell across the border. Justice for George, you know. We're going to do the blackout screen, you know, uh, mm. blackout Tuesday. And we're going to we're going to talk about, you know, injustice and justice for George when we're yelling across the border. But as it pertains to like what's happening right under our noses, you know, um, we often don't when we start talking about that, we get silent. And that's what's happened to me. Like, I've been frightened. If I can just be honest, I have many white friends um, that I love and who love me. Um, but because of my experiences in the past where when I open up or share things like what we're talking about right now, or even things that maybe they may have done and I thought would be in a safe place to say, hey, you know what, this that was not the best choice of words yeah. or whatever, or this is how this made me feel. They stop talking to me or they say, you know, um, or they, they're dismissive, you know, things of this nature. And, and, and so a lot of, they don't realize that and many white people don't realize it's here. Those school of things that I told you about, they happen here in Canada. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the things that we're talking about, even in terms of the system, when you're talking about systemic racism and systematic racism, when you're, when you're looking at who are the, who are the majority of our children's teachers, you know, um, they're usually white and they're usually white females, you know, mm. who are the, in terms of history, right? When kids are learning about history, they're usually learning about white historical events. Mm -hmm. Black history will usually get just a month out of the year. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so we'll focus in on some black Canadians in the Canadian context or in the American context, the same deal. But, you know, we're only about, a, we get a month, you know? Mm -hmm. when, it, when you talk about uh, going out, when we're talking about things like white privilege, you mm -hmm. don't, when you go to the grocery store, there's a special aisle for ethnic foods and things of this nature. When you get hair products, I can't buy my hair products. My wife can't get her hair products in the just in the general grocery store. Mm -hmm. You know, we got to go to a special store even now wow. to get our hair products. Or there's a special section in the grocery store <laughs> for us to have these sorts of experiences. So, or in order to get these products. So when you're talking about the dominant culture, the history, there is so much contribution of Afro-Canadians, Afro-Caribbeans, African-Americans to the world, in whether they're inventions or things of this nature that have made life the way that they are for us today that are overlooked. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I don't know if I can. Can I just can I just be honest with you about an experience that happened with my wife? Yes, and I? please, please share with so, us. So when you're talking, <laughs> my wife and I, man, just recently we were. It was my wife's birthday, her 36th birthday. She doesn't look anywhere near 36. Uh, and, you know, we were we were out and I was trying to just make a picnic for my wife. I saved some money up. I got her some diamond earrings and I was excited about these diamond earrings. I couldn't wait to be able to give them to her. And so I end up going to, um, you know, to the to the park because they just had opened the park. Club. I got my blanket and I'm just, you know, just sweetening her up. We got her favorite food. We're, I'm, put, I'm getting ready to put out the blanket. And two white ladies walk by us. And this lady looks at me and she says, and she looks at us and she says, oh, I've traveled all around the world. And this is a form of microaggression. And this is one of the microaggressions I'll, I'll, um, is a term to familiarize yourself with as well. Um, and she goes, oh, I've traveled all around the world. And I know you people, when you take out your blankets, you know, uh, it makes you feel close to home, doesn't it? You know, it makes you feel comfortable when you people take out your blankets, right? Um, and I just know, like, you know, and my wife and I, first of all, she was messing up the mood, right? <laughs> and second of all, it's like, where do you, who is you people? Right. Who, you know, what, do you, what do you mean? Because you, you, you assume um, you've profiled me, mm. you have 
You have judged that you know where I'm from. And the practice, taking out a plain blanket, a gray blanket, means that I am connecting to my home. And my wife says, hey, we're actually from Scarborough, which is just up the street. <laughs> and she goes, this is, this is a form of microaggression. Wow. She goes, no, where are you really from? Right? Even after we told her we're from Scarborough, she goes, where are you really from? Right? As if, you know, no, you can't be from here. You know, you can't, you can't have an experience similar to mine. Laying out a blanket on the grass could not just be a picnic and something that you're doing. White, you wouldn't walk up to a white person and be like, hey, are you from, you know, which part of Europe are you from? Or it would be rude for me to walk up and be like, hey, do you have mayonnaise on your sandwich? Because all people like, all white people love mayonnaise, right? So it, it, you see where I'm going oh, with yeah. this. And so for her to come and say that, not only is it disrespectful, but then also, and, um, and profiling, but then even after I've said to her, you know what? No, uh, we're from Scarborough. For her to say, no, where are you really from, yeah, right? right? Yeah. That's microaggression. And that's an example of classic microaggression, the way that white people exercise that, even here in Canada, right? You know, I... I am trying to understand white privilege, and I think the the better pictures that have helped me understand white privilege is just to say that, you know, there's a number of steps that as a white person in a white world, um, I don't have to take in order to see my dreams happen or get a mortgage or uh, whatever, have an opportunity. And it feels like what I'm noticing is that within the black community, you start at a disadvantage simply because of the color of your skin. Now, there are other elements that play into that, but rooted in the idea that you don't get a fair shake. You start at a disadvantage. And and I, I mean, for me, it's, it's really becoming so clear that it, you know, even when we think about normal things like holidays and um, like you said, even going to the grocery store, um, I heard one analogy even about like an iPhone and facial recognition and how facial recognition was designed around a white face. And so iPhone has trouble identifying a black face. And Absolutely. that's just, I mean, this is what we mean when we talk about white privilege and and systemic issues. We're talking about things that are, that really, what, what, what I'm trying to do here with you, Andrew, is I just wanna elevate for people the reality that it's not equitable just because we say it's Canada and everybody has an opportunity. It's not the same kind of opportunity for you or for me. You know, it's not the same. The fight is harder and and I just, I just feel like I want to acknowledge that with you, you know? I appreciate that, man. And it's like, even in terms of equality, the difference between equality and equity, you know, hmm. it's like there are people who may be even receive similar positioning, for example, but it doesn't mean that, um, that we are seeing, that you see us as equal, right, to you. So you can receive similar positioning and all this, but you'll get less pay. You know, historically, those are the sorts of things that happen. Um, and, and again, it's like whales lives matter. I heard a pastor this week was saying whales lives matter and dogs lives matter. You know, people are locked up in prison right now for, for going to the rescue for dogs. And in many cases, you know, people will, will, will equate the life of a black person. Right. And we've seen it just historically, even in, in an American context, if you realize the vote of a black person was counted as three fifths of a human being, yeah. right? This is written in the constitution where black person is seen as three fifths of a human being, right? So these are the sorts of things when we're talking about systemic uh, racism, as you're, as you're talking about the system, there are a lot of things that white people will look and say, well, you're not doing this, or you're not doing that. Yes. And again, this is not from a place of shaming. It's just a reality, right? You're not doing this. You haven't achieved this. All that, a lot of the stereotypes are as a result of us starting behind and us having to really work above and beyond the average white person right. who can leave their house, who can go into a place and not have people mispronounce your name not um, judge you based upon your name, you know? Um, 
or, you know, and automatically write you off, you know, all of these various things like names and like, you can leave your house, like you said, and you can run around a rich, a rich neighborhood right. and, and not fear for your life. Ahmad couldn't do that. Mm. Right. And so, so for you, you know, I, I really appreciate you acknowledging that. And I think that's a massive step um, for, for, for us to head in the right direction, kind of arm in yeah. arm. Well, I mean, that's, that's the goal is how do we get on the same side of this terrible issue? Because yeah. it, I, I have to confess that in life, in my life, there's been a tremendous amount of ignorance about the plight of someone who would call yeah. themselves, you know, an American, uh, you know, like me, someone who called themselves a Canadian, someone who would call themselves a Christian. And, yeah. and yet the inequity is becoming more and more evident. And so, I mean, is there a way? Is there, is there a way, Andrew, for us to begin to lock arms, to, for us to stand together as, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ and carry the same heart? And what, what, is that, what does that look like? Is there a way that that can be done? Well, that's a great question. And I think, you know, um, the gospel demands and the mission of Christ demands for us to, uh, it demands for us to be able to lock arms in this. Yeah. It demands because the, the, the commission is to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. You know, we're just coming out of celebrating Pentecost weekend. Yeah. Um, you know, when Jesus says, stand here and you're going to be imbued with power um, and endowed with power to not just preach the gospel um, here where they were at at that time, but on a local, a regional, a national, and an international level. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit comes so that we can reach um, and integrate diverse people groups. So it's it's necessary. The, the end picture of heaven in Revelation 7-9 is, you know, um, that there's a multitude that cannot be numbered of mm. every nation, tribe, tongue. You know, this is, this is the picture of heaven, right? It's not homogenous by any right. means. So I think it demands that we have these conversations. It demands that we work through these things. And so the first thing I would say in terms of locking arms is that, you know, we got to move past things like saying, um, you know, I don't see color. And for mm. some, you've already heard this, but you know, when you say I don't see color, first of all, that's a lie. When we walk outside, we see green trees, mm -hmm. we see, you know, red flowers. God was intentional about his creation. Mm -hmm. And so it's imperative that we acknowledge that there is a difference uh, between all of God's creation. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, so that's number one. Also, not jumping to conclusions, right? Not jumping to the finish line, like, okay, 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 racism, racism, blah, 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 blah. How do we just get to pass this mm. now? You know, it's um, being sympathetic. It's being empathetic. Um, if there are people in, of color in your life, there are black people specifically um, in this scenario in your life, right? Going and taking a listening position, a learning position, which I commend you for even in this, Pastor Andy, listening, because every black person's <laughs> Uh, experience is not the same. I once had a, uh, a white lady who came to our church, even as a pastor. I think I shared this with you uh, talking. Tell us again. You know, she came and I I laugh about it now, but in the moment, you know, she she um, she didn't she didn't remember any of the black men's names, and she said, "The only way I can tell the difference between all of you is by your shoes." Hmm. You know, and this is such again microaggressive white privilege um, sort of a scenario where she is saying that um, she doesn't want to take the time to learn about each person, each black person, because she's categorizing, group them mm. in the same. And what this means, so it's important to talk to individual black people to get their experiences. Africans are different than Afro-Canadians and Afro-Caribbeans and African-Americans. So don't jump, jumble everyone together, but have genuine relationships. When we're talking about moving forward, examining your circle, you know, um, this scenario is very reaction, reactionary, yeah. like it's a reactive scenario, but start leading with questions like, am I considering or am I including my black brothers and sisters? Not for the sake of tokenism, but even those who you're in relationship with, searching your heart. How have I been overlooking, you know? Um, also, so it's, I would say heart starting in the mirror. And then I'd say also home because it starts at home. So many 
kids grow up in a place of racism and you know they didn't even they didn't want to you know but it was, they were imbued with these thought processes because of their parents and so starting in the mirror but then going to the home the dinner table is the most powerful pulpit mm. Um, I think that we can use to begin to shift the generational perspective on what it means to be, um, to what equity means, especially in the context of the wow. kingdom. And then the last thing I would say is white people using your privilege, right? Using your privilege and your platform to speak out against it. When you're in circles, because I've been there and I've actually, it's even more awkward when a black man is present, you know, but when you're by yourselves and you're hearing people say microaggressive statements, like, you know, I got to watch my purse because there's a black man mm. here or, huh, you know, we can't be too, you can't be too, you know, I've seen and heard these things. It's like you you speak up and say, actually, no, nah, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, actually, no, I I, I don't have that experience or no, I, I don't think so. You know, speaking up because silence is deafening. Mm you know, and silence is injustice as well, you know, when you need to speak up. So I would say those are ways that we can do so. And for church, in a church context and church leaders, like, you know, leading with questions again, like, are we represent, are we representing people other than ourselves? Are we representing the heart and the mission of Christ in what we are marketing Mm. in what we are putting out there, leading with those questions, as opposed to waiting for something inflamed to happen in the media or for somebody to complain, right. you know? Um, yeah. So including Black people, since we're speaking about Black people and Black Lives Matter, including them in the decision-making. Because can I say one last thing in regards to one of the Please. challenges? Please. Is that, you know, historically, Black people are included in an entertainment right. place, right? So, and so a lot of people, especially Americans, my friends from the outside, they'll look and they'll be like, man, I didn't even believe that racism exists in Canada. You guys have so much diversity and I call it topical diversity or surface diversity. And it depends wow. where you go. Obviously, some places are more, um, have more, you know, if a difference in in, um, in in culture than other places. But especially here in Toronto, they're like, man, you guys got so many people, different colors and different races and ethnic backgrounds. And we're like, yeah. But then when you look at the places of power, you know, you'll see us in places of entertainment because historically black people entertain mm. white people, you know? And so you're okay with us entertaining. But then when you look in the places of decision-making and power, if I could just keep it real, yeah. you know? You'll note and you'll see that it is very rare that there is a um, a black presence in decision making mm-hmm. across our boards and our leadership teams. It's very rare, and so again, it's including black people, especially in the context of the gospel and our mission, including us into the places where decisions are made. Right, not just trying to guess. Hey, I wonder what the blacks would like. I wonder what, no, but how about you bring us into the conversation? Mm. The fact that we are, that there are many of us who are starting behind. How about bearing one another's Mm. burdens, according to Galatians chapter six, giving us a seat at the table, Mm. you know, if you truly love us. These are the, 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 the important things to consider. Instead of championing all lives matter. Yes, all lives most like definitely matter, but all lives can't matter until black lives matter, Mm. you know? And so, those are th- those are things that are imperative, I think, when we're talking about making steps forward, um, considering all of those things, right. heart, home, privilege and platform, using those things to move us forward. Man, I, I appreciate I appreciate what you're saying, especially want to just draw attention for our people to that last piece that that um, that you brought to the surface. You know, there there is a subtlety that shifts the focus away from particular issues and into a general issue, moving from Black Lives Matter to All Lives Matter actually has a, has a, a negative, a, a converse effect on the issue that we're addressing. So to, to, to my people, to those who are listening right now, GT family and beyond who are listening to this, let me just say to you that there are many conversations that we need to have. There's so many. There's conversations about very uh, varied groups of people who are marginalized. There's there's conversations that we need to have about um, homelessness and about First Nations issues and about um, those who come from um, 
from China or or Korea or whatever, like, you know, uh, from India. These are all conversations that we can have, but we can't have them all at the same time. And to have them all at the same time devalues the conversation we currently have. And the reason why I want to bring that up is because I got to tell you, that's something I'm just learning. I'm just learning that now. And Andrew's helping me value his pain. I heard it said this way, give him the right to bleed. That it's okay for him to hurt over what has happened to him, over his fears for his family and his dreams for a future and his church and their predominantly black community uh, in their church that feels some of these exact same things that Pastor Andrew is sharing. And just giving voice to that and acknowledging that and being committed to stand arm in arm. And I think that's really the heart of what we're trying to share here today. So my brother, my friend, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today and sharing honestly and openly about your journey. And thank you because, you know, you still love me even when I'm ignorant and I don't get it. And and there's a generosity in you and an ability to um, endure and achieve in the midst of opposition and obstacle. And I commend you for it. And I love you. I love you too, bro. And, I, and like I said, from jump, man, you know, you have been so gracious towards me and towards my family. And, you know, this is an area where you may need to learn, right? But I'm, I've learned so many things from you, right? And I continue to learn from you. And I think it's, it's a symbiotic relationship. So by no means do I think I'm greater than you or better than you or any of this. Um, I, I just think we're continuing to learn together. Yeah. And, um, and, and so thank you for this platform. Thank you for being a part of the solution um, because this is really how it happens, um, starting with ourselves, but also using our platform. And that, that speaks volumes of your character and that of your lovely wife and your church. So God bless you guys as you continue to move forward thank you. as well. We're with you. We're together. And, uh, and we're going to keep fighting and we're going to keep learning, growing, and certainly going to keep praying.